Welcome back to Spin Magazine's Lip Service. Welcoming Royal Blood, Mike Kerr and Ben Thatcher. How are you guys? Well done, Ben. <laughs> we're, we're here. We're ready to roll. Thank God we made it. We There was like a wrong address, but thank God we, we got it all sorted out. And thanks for coming, by the way. Do you like New York? You guys fans of New York? Love New York. Spend a lot of time here, here and there? I do, actually, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I probably spent kind of a third of my time here over the past couple of Yes, yeah, so yeah. I mean, it's different energy than LA where nobody works out there, right? Nobody's, there's nothing going on in LA. People just kind of relax and don't do anything. But New York, you have to hustle. There's a hustle that goes on. Yeah, sure. they're, they're very different, aren't they? I like that it's only LA that you can compare it to yeah. with American cities. <laughs> it's as like, well. yeah, let's compare it to <laughs> yeah, the place right. that's literally the furthest away from yeah. anywhere else. Well, there's only two cities. There's like LA and New York. And the I love New York so much that I brought a hat that says it <laughs> on it. I love literally it. on it. Well, by the way, congrats on a number one fourth record, which is incredible. It's got to feel great, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty nuts, to be honest with you. Yeah. Tell me a little bit. I want to take it back to the beginning, just kind of how you guys started, your history. You grew up in Brighton by the sea, so definitely different than New York. And I'd love to know the history of how you guys met early on. I know there's uh, Australia came into play at some point in your history early on. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's a, yeah, that's a big question. I'll try and keep it brief, but we... We kind of known each other since we were 15 um, and we come from two very small seaside towns, um, very quiet, sleepy places. Um, so if you're into music and in that part of the world, you know, it's not hard to find other musicians because they're so, you know, it's a very small, I don't want to call it a scene, but it's a very small kind of community. There's only like two drummers in Brighton. Or exactly. So, you know, you know, you know, every, every right. band knows each other. Yeah. So we kind of grew up in that environment really playing in lots of different bands and um yeah this is the last band that we started but initially it was a it was a three piece you guys formed like early on and there was actually you were playing keyboards and guitar which is a strange instrument by the way but i mean it's ultimately just a keyboard isn't it but yeah. just different a different position of playing it um it's a keyboard with a strap yeah <laughs> You won't Strap be bringing on. the guitar into the into the live setting by any chance, no. And not unless you want it. <laughs> so you guys get together and tell me about Australia. I think there was that was early on, right before you got Australia together. Australia is very hot. It is, it and is. everything's <laughs> trying to kill you. <laughs> There's more things in Australia that can kill you, I believe, than anywhere else in the world. Is that true? It is true. Yeah. Um, yeah, I went to Australia and um, I had a great time. Yeah, smoked a lot of weed. Um, listened to a lot of Led Zeppelin. Um, and, um, and then kind of just went home, honestly. Um, and that's when Ben and I kind of, yeah, kind of committed to just recording a few songs and kind of getting out there with this band and, and just having a bit of fun. What were you listening to growing up musically? What were your parents into? What did your parents do for a living? Um, I mean, I was listening to Queen, I guess, ultimately. Queen, The Beatles, The Beach Boys. I would say those three were kind of, um, yeah. Yeah, and Ben, what were you listening to growing up? Um, my parents really didn't listen to music. They um, were involved in church, though, which always had music. So I guess like church music. My brothers um, were in a Christian rock band called Delirious, who um, later toured with the likes of Bon Jovi and Brian Adams. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess I was brought up in that kind of world. Um, and yeah, my, I remember my dad having a, he was into the shadows actually, and, uh, was quite into Cliff Richard. And I remember he had a, an album it was called Hank Plays Cliff, which was just Hank Marvin playing Cliff, uh, Cliff Richard songs. And did you go to London a lot? Was there a scene in Brighton at all? I imagine there was a very, not really a scene growing up, I would imagine, right? Yeah. You know, a lot of clubs to play in. There's, Brighton's a, quite a big city for yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of, the culture in Brighton's pretty mad and um, there's a lot of diverse people there and anything goes, really. It's like, kind of like the San Francisco of um, mm. the UK. Seashore. And early on, it's funny because I know that you were saying, Mike, there's a lot of gigs where nobody saw you and, you know, people don't know that there's all, you know, there's all that time you put in where it's all the, the spinal tap moments where you're playing for no one, not mm. even the bartender maybe. And, you know, talk a little bit about the first gigs. I think that your first gig was at a pub and that's kind of like the early beginnings of the band. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of environment that we honestly, we're used to playing shows in, you know, 
Um, ben and I played in multiple bands together. We've done weddings together. Um, and yeah, kind of everything you can imagine. So um, yeah, so the early Raw Blood shows were just essentially open mic nights, really, where we would just show up with our gear. Um, we didn't do... Yeah, with that, that's just how... That's just what we always did, you know, so just normal beginnings like any other band. But fairly untraditional to not have a guitar, obviously. I saw you guys at the Mercury Lounge, I think it mm. was 2013, and I was blown away. I was like, where's the guitar? Like, yeah. the, the sound was enormous, and sometimes I guess bands can kind of overcompensate when you're a duo by, you know, you've, you've got this incredible fuzz on the bass, and I was like, what's going on? Where's the guitar player? So no guitar player. But early yeah. on, how did you know that was going to work for you? I think we were just kind of led by the sound, honestly. Um it it wasn't weird to us that there wasn't a guitar because we were listening to a, the noise that we were making and it sounded substantial. So that never really crossed our minds. So take me back to like 2013. You have like 300 bucks, 300 quids, and you mm -hmm. spend it on figure it out. And you're like, was it working for you? Was it clicking for you? Did you feel like those were going to just be demos? Your only goal in sight was just to possibly recoup that money or did you have some yeah, grandiose plan no there definitely was no <laughs> grandiose plan i <laughs> mean it, it was just kind of um half of the course really like that's what you did when you started a new band as you made an ep and then um put out online and no one gives a shit and then you uh soundcloud or whatever go and play to like no one that, but <laughs> we but that was enough like we were it, it felt like at that point we'd been in a lot of bands that would all kind of like trying to get somewhere and make it or whatever and um this this band just felt like let's kind of retire that idea and just kind of play gigs and for the for the sake of playing it for ourselves and for our friends and there was no yeah there was no like ambition in terms of like being a, a successful band but I was, it's actually happened like fairly quickly for you i think you got to deal with warner chapel within like a year of recording <laughs> figure it out right so yeah super fast yeah that yeah. i think yeah that figure it out being on soundcloud um, I mean, we were so naive to the music industry. We didn't even know what a publisher was. So how did that uh, happen for you? Because ultimately, like, it usually doesn't take a year. You you know, you're slaving an hour. You're playing clubs Just a big years. Warner Brothers helicopter <laughs> right, just landed right. on my parents' house. <laughs> By the way, we want to sign you guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how did you meet Warner Chapel early on? Um, we just met in a pub. That's it? Yeah. And, and, and yeah, they kind of explained um, what they do. And... Uh, it was a bit like that scene in Wayne's World, you know? <laughs> yeah. And walk me up that point Drop from there band. until the until the first record, obviously. Talk to me about how that all came about. I think what that really afforded us to do was um, to commit a year of our lives to writing, you know? Um, we had a... We must have had half the album at that point. Um, so, yeah, it was just... We just saw it as an opportunity to write a record. Mm. Um, and again, there was, even at this stage, there wasn't, it wasn't expectations of it going anywhere. We just thought this is like a window of, of opportunity that's been afforded to us. And, um, it could all let, they, we could get to the end of the year and nothing happens, but like, this is a great opportunity to make a record. Yeah, and that's this, exactly what we did. Yeah, I was going to say you have this massive success with the first album and you go on to have, this is now your fourth number one album. So you have fans like Jimmy Page, Dave Grohl, the Arctic Monkeys. How does it feel at this point in your career? I think you, this record for me feels like a departure from the first record. The first record is obviously tons of riffs. This record, you, you, can, you know, there's a lot of different directions. There's piano on the record. There's mm. some references to like 90s alt rock. There's a bunch of stuff going on. So this record in particular is because you have your own studio in Brighton and you were able to just go in there and record whenever you needed to, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think, um, I think evolution is a, just a, natural part of being a human being and um i think it's uh it would be more surprising to have not changed musically over the past 10 years you mm. know um and it feels like fairly incremental it doesn't feel like we've ever taken unnecessary leaps forwards it's mm. it's just yeah but it feels like a natural growth every time we put a record out um and yeah like you were saying having our own studio that's that's just something that's kind of come around quite naturally as well. Um, I think we've always been interested in being able to record ourselves um, and just seeing other musicians and artists having their own place and, and kind of, yeah, how 
uh, that can really serve creativity, you know, because it just means you can be in the moment and on the fly and you can you can record songs as you're writing them. You know, and that kind of freedom is amazing. Did you feel like you needed an outside voice to sell produce this record? And before, obviously, you worked with a lot of people, Josh Ohm included. So did you feel like at some point you need to show the songs to the label or they just let you do what you wanted to do at this point? I think our friends is probably who we were playing stuff to the most. Yeah. So who um, do you play it for when you're writing songs? Josh Price. <laughs> right. That's it. He can't be here today, but <laughs> Josh, Josh Price, bless him, has heard all That's our it. demos. I think you get a feeling when you're playing a song to someone where you kind of, um, yeah, you know whether it's good or not. Yeah. Or or you can pinpoint what's wrong about it. And um, yeah, it's kind of, it, nothing's really changed from the very beginning of our, our band, you know. It's kind of, we're just trying to impress our friends. But do you take that feedback when, if your friends are, hey, I don't really like Absolutely this Absolutely not, no. <laughs> I say, don't talk to me ever again. <laughs> yeah, right. they're wrong. <laughs> You're wrong. Always wrong. <laughs> well, it's, it's incredible. This uh, this marks the 10-year anniversary of the debut record, actually, yes. next year. Any big plans for the record? A lot of fireworks. A lot of fireworks. A lot of, yeah, Ben's pretty into fireworks. Hollywood yeah. Bowl, fireworks. Ho we've yeah. rented out the Hollywood Bowl. <laughs> it's, uh, I've already started... Um, started the firework display already <laughs> in preparation it's yeah it's gonna be three hours long amazing i'll be there for sure well tell me about the process of recording this record obviously the first record was done way differently and this record you're experimenting like i said I, I saw a great video online of even with the piano you were playing you know inside the piano and mm. kind of taking some chances i think and again self-producing this record does the process of recording a record like this change from the way you used to make records early on no not really i think um, you know, when it comes to producing our own band, you know, I think that's, I think that's very different from being a producer, you know? Mm. Um, so the, the role of producer never really crosses our minds. It, it's, it's just a case of we're just building our own songs and recording our own songs, you know? Yeah. So, um, it doesn't feel like, yeah, we're playing that role necessarily. Um, and, and the way that we work creatively is that, if we're both excited about something, then it's what we're going to do. Mm. So we just kind of, that's our only real way of measuring the quality of what we're doing, you know? And and, and you, sh you should be making music for yourself anyway. No question. So the, we're, there's, there's, we're not kind of analyzing <laughs> the market, you know? We're yeah. just like, how does this make us feel? Does it make us feel good? Then, then that's it, end of, but it's was very simple. A, but, but the last record was done during lockdown. So there's a bit yes. of a, there's a bit of a dance element to it, obviously, and and we were all going through such a dark time. So was there a, a kind of a way that you wanted to lift people up with the last record versus you know just the sentiment that's going on? Some of the best music comes out of the darkest times, right? So if you yeah. look at some of my favorite records, it's all think back to the first couple of Zeppelin records or Aerosmith or even mm -hmm. early on. So it always comes out of this time of despair versus you know happier times. I mean, I, I feel like. You know, the legacy is sometimes due to what we're going through in life, and it's a reflection of what we're going through in life. So did this record kind of reflect what we were going through, your, your inspiration for this one in particular? Um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, kind of everything on the record is speaking from experience. I find um, writing lyrics about kind of dark times, I find that very difficult when you're in it. You kind of have to, for personally, I have to kind of, come out of it and be in a pretty good headspace um so there's a, there's a strange paradox writing about kind of misery and depression when yeah. you're kind of doing great yeah and i hate to bring it up my favorite records are always done by artists when they're on drugs i don't know why mm -hmm. i feel like we're always on drugs <laughs> we're on like, drugs right now but you think about it people get clean and sober and sometimes the writing changes but uh mm. yeah it's interesting is that what was it like by the way working with josh from queens of the stone age oh amazing yeah any yeah. more plans to work with him coming up? Um, we're working on a house together, the three, yeah, the three of us. <laughs> You're going to move in together? Yeah, Desert yeah. Session 7 or something? Yeah, we've, yeah. We're, we're all pretty into architecture these days. So, um. <laughs> But do you think you have any more plans to work with him coming up? Uh, there's nothing in the diary, no. Okay. But I mean, yeah. Is there anyone that, that you'd love to work with that you haven't collaborated with yet? Um, I mean, yeah, there's like, there's there's quite a lot of people. I, I, I wouldn't want to just sort of throw a name out there. Yeah. No, well, we might yeah, manifest yeah. it and make it happen. You know? Maybe, yeah. Was there ever a time when you thought we should add a guitar player for the touring version? If you look at the Black Keys, obviously they added a mm. bunch of members at some point. And I think I saw them, there was like five members in the band. 
Uh, even the Kills, who I'm very friendly with, they would add a couple drummers here and there and not play with the drum machine. But ever given that some thought or, or never? Because I, like I said, when I saw you guys first at the Mercury Lounge years ago, I was like, the sound is bombastic. You don't need yeah. other instrumentations. But I with think, this new record in particular, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's piano. I and, think if there's one kind of common piece of feedback we get from our band, it's always that it sounds big. So that's kind of adding a guitar is is isn't really on the priority list of things to do yeah you know we have um a friend we get a darren, lot of criticism right? yeah we have darren yeah he he doesn't play a guitar but he plays the the key the keyboards the it, keyboards the, the, yeah and he okay. does uh ever since the the third record which has gone down the more dancey dancey route the typhoons record yeah um <clears throat> we needed some extra help some extra hands and he had Great hands. <laughs> Best hands in the biz. <laughs> yeah. You have any thoughts about these bands that use backing tracks? I mean, obviously, there's so many pop artists now that they're not, the mic isn't anywhere near them, and there was like sound coming out, and obviously, you guys just get we down just, and dirty. Yeah, and, we've just never done it. So yeah. it's sort of, it would be weird to start now. Um, and we kind of like the not being tethered to something, you know, we don't, we don't play to like a click track or yeah. anything like that. So we like the idea that it, it just leaves space for kind of, yeah anything goes it's interesting some of the best songs come out of mistakes right and if you think about mm -hmm. a song like tell me when it's too late i think it came about because you guys were just messing about and the drum beat i, I think kind of was the the inspiration for the song yeah. right a great bonham-esque beat by the way thank you yeah. stolen straight from his foot <laughs> so tell me about that how did that happen you, you, i you think that's a good example of um how we're having your own recording space or at least allowing time in a recording session for experimenting can be really useful because we were chasing another idea and just kind of working on a little a drum sound um and getting a drum sound usually involves ben playing the drums for five hours right. um, and then wanting to whilst, stop while someone's just going like this <laughs> right. and then we what were we doing again and that was the beat he was playing so yeah it being in the moment like that and being like actually screw this idea we're working on let's let's focus on this yeah. there's something in this so yeah so I'm saying, I was talking to Pat from the Black Keys, and he said to me, no good albums were ever made up you know, using a, a click track. If you listen to Zeppelin, they mm -hmm. never used the click track. But I guess that's something that never came into play with any of your records, right? It's all about the yeah. ebb and flow of the music. And the yeah, I mean, there's been songs, you know, like particularly the last record where the click track was kind of important because we were shooting for something very, like, dancey and, and, and the kind of references we had were, like, it was, was as tight as nails. Whereas there's stuff on this record where it's it's much more, yeah, the songs were served better by not doing it that way. Mm. So I don't, I don't think there's a, it's just kind of like everything we do when we're recording, it's just like a song by song basis. Like what what does the song need, you know? It's a fantastic new record, by the way, and I want to oh, touch thanks. base on some of it. You know, songs like Pull Me Through, incredible song. And again, I think a departure, there's piano in the song. You never would have heard piano on your first record or two. And no. it was all about bombastic riffs, right? So again, talking about kind of branching out with this new record and different instrumentations and just going in different directions. Obviously, I, with the last record, I think you started to step out in songs like Typhoon. There was, you know, there's dance group. You could dance to it. You know, even the, the song you did with Josh Holm, again, like just another take on what you were doing. Mm -hmm. I feel with the last record, you started opening up and, and every band progresses and every band evolves. So I feel like you really evolved with this album. So again, let's talk about like Pull Me Through for a second, an incredible track on the record. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Well, I think like you were saying, the, the last record kind of was the first time we began to boldly introduce additional layers. Um, not guitars, I'm sorry to say. I know, yeah, I feel like you I want mean, to put it, some guitar. It does sound like a guitar, yeah. I have to say. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> yeah. um, so I feel like, yeah, going into this album, we it kind of just, we felt permission to kind of go for that. And it felt like we could, there was a broader palette there if we wanted it, you know, because I think some songs on the album are, you know, are more laid and then there's other songs that are more stripped back. And it was, yeah, it's kind of liberating to know that um, we had full use of the gear stick, you know, mm. we could do either or. Um, so Pull Me Through, um, that was, you know, written, I guess, mainly on the piano and as a pretty complete song, um, which was kind of fun because it meant going into the studio, it, it was... It was about really how we were going to musically support it, you know. I think 
usually it would be reverse engineered for us typically for a song we would either have a riff or, or a groove in mind um, and then we would kind of poke at it until it starts resembling a song so yeah a lot of songs in this album kind of were the other way around so that so around was the piano. A quite a, yeah yeah um, and we, we're always cross-referencing what we're doing on piano or acoustic to make sure that it sort of melodically checks out as mm -hmm. a as a as a song so um i think this time around it was just a case of realizing that the piano in that particular track was the really the spine of the song and and uh and something that just made it sound new yeah i heard you mention that some of your friends who obviously you're playing this stuff or <laughs> thought this sounded like your first band this record in particular, right? The first band that you had. Not my first band. <laughs> or maybe your second band. What, what of your first I band? I maintain that no one sounds like my first band. <laughs> maybe not the first one, but yeah. maybe. The, is it scary sometimes to change direction musically for you? It doesn't feel like change. It just feels like revealing parts of us that um, haven't either have been shown yet, you mm. know? It's not like we kind of go digging around the genre basket and right. pull out <laughs> something and work? do let's do that. <laughs> right. It's it's stuff that's, um, yeah, it's the catalogue of music that's influenced us over our whole lives. Um, and I think finding finding new territory is the reason to continue making records. Mm. You know, that there has to be, we're in it for ourselves. It's, yeah. all, it's all very self-indulgent. As it should be, for sure. Yeah. Do you find yourself writing on tour or is it mostly when you have the break? Like <laughs> Mountains of Midnight, I think, was written at a sound check, right? Yeah, I think sound checks is a good a good kind of uh space to do that yeah um particularly where like for us like making records is also about the live show really mm. kind of wanting to yeah equ equip our show with with songs that are going to work well so when you're like in soundcheck you're literally like does this feel good in here because this is this is where ultimately where we're going to play it never written a song in la by the way right yeah, we have. Oh, have you? Okay. Just not very good ones. <laughs> right. That one to use. <laughs> Everyone's written a song in LA. <laughs> Let's talk about this album lyrically. It's coming from a bit of a darker place for you. Do you feel like you're a bit more vulnerable on this record, just opening them up and kind of accepting on, on kind of who you are and being vulnerable to the outside? I think so. I, and I hope so. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I don't know if it's for me to say, but yeah, I think um, I, I'd, I'd certainly would say that there's points musically where it's much more stripped back so there's less uh yeah less for me to hide behind in that sense yeah mm. i think if you talk about songs like wave and pull me through you probably wouldn't have seen that side of you a few years back right yeah yeah i think everything on this album is felt like we hadn't done it before yeah you know so that was the sort of i think anything that felt like fresh or or, or a new take on on, on something that that was the that was the green light for us to kind of pursue an idea. Definitely. And it's also interesting, like when you're young and you're broke, you have no money, lyrically you're coming from a different place than when you have success, right? And then you're secure in who you are. And now this is your fourth number one record, right? So do you feel like your writing has changed just in terms of what the way you approach songwriting now? No. I think um I think it's ultimately just an exploration of kind of who you are. And mm. I think it doesn't matter um where you find yourself in life mm. you know like um the human experience is is kind of shared you know yeah. so if, yeah I, I haven't yeah i mean unless you start writing songs about like being on tour <laughs> right. being well they on, always say you have you know being your on whole the tour life, bus, yeah. yeah you have a whole life to write your first record and then a year to write your second record so yeah do you, are you one of those bands that likes to take time when you're off the road to kind of write and regroup or do you you take a break in between just to find that inspiration no. again. Are we taking a break? No. Not really. We're no we breaks. kind of just straight into it. <laughs> we we run on on the wheel <laughs> and it just keeps going. I the know. wheel keeps turning. <laughs> Let's touch base a little bit on Jimmy Page, by the way. So it's incredible mm. to have that symbiotic relationship with him. I mean, is it you feel are you sometimes pinching yourself that this is a guy that you're like, are you friendly with Jimmy Page? Is he are you on a text basis with him at this point? No texting, but um yeah, I mean, you know. I think one of our first shows in New York, you know, he was at and, um, and, you know, I think that was very early on in our career, you know, mm. it was, um, we were very much just being discovered. So 
yeah, having kind of his his nod of approval was yeah, it was wild. And um, I mean, obviously, still, Ben, you're a big yeah. Zeppelin fan. So, were you a big Zeppelin fan too, Mike? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would just listen to Zeppelin records and just like stare at the speaker. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. There's an incredible documentary I saw today called Mr. Jimmy that's coming out about a guy in Japan who's actually a kimono salesman who wants to be Jimmy Page. You know, he's in a tribute band, but he literally like to the T, like every performance from like 78, he can duplicate and Jimmy has seen him a bunch wow. of times. And yeah, so so when you meet someone like Jimmy Page and again, he's giving you awards and you're presenting awards to him. Are you, are you like, all right, I think that this is definitely one of the highlights of our career. I feel like, uh, you know, I mean, it's got to feel good at that point, right, for you? Yeah, this, it just uh, makes it very clear that, you know, this, like, he's so obsessed with music in the same way we are. And um, we'd all happily sit down and talk about, you know, pedals. Fat, and- yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and just nerd out. And I think um, like whenever we've met someone who we've looked up to and, or who's, you know, been a big influence on us, it always comes back to that kind of oh we're in the same yeah <laughs> we're all, we're all pursuing the same thing here you know and um yeah there's a there's a commonality you know that's that's powerful because yeah we're all just we're all just chasing the same same thing definitely i assume you're a band that would i don't know if you look at the news with what's happening with ai at all artists like drake drake in the weekend there's this artist uh, ghostwriter yeah. that used ai to create the song that was Almost, uh, you know, there was a, a chance it was going to be nominated for a Grammy, which is crazy when you think about it. Mm. You're definitely not a band that would ever use that, but what are your thoughts on where it's going musically in this world today? Well, one thing's clear. We're all going down. <laughs> yeah, sometime soon. <laughs> you included. <laughs> yeah. But do you have any thoughts on where that's all going? Because it's crazy that you can create a song through AI and that yeah. that could somehow be eligible for a Grammy. I think... Um, I think we're too early on at the minute, but I think there'll become a time where people care about the origin of something. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a it's a big question. That's a whole other podcast. I, 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 <laughs> also, <laughs> podcast. I also think that um, music is the least of the problems for, yeah. for AI. Right. It's the writers. It's TV. It's film. It's things. I like think that. it's going to get worse than that. Yeah. Art. Everything. Also, loads of good's going to come from it as well. Yeah. I mean, it is it is fairly interesting, but I guess like I look at the time, you know, back in the day with Napster and Metallic and what was going on, I think there's a, probably a way to embrace it and to figure out how to use it. But I don't. obviously, you don't strike me as the kind of artist that would want to use AI in your song, right? Well, probably, AI wrote this entire record. <laughs> yeah. Did the cover. So I feel like everything. a bit of a hypocrite. But, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the tour, by the way. Tour, tour of Muses. Actually, you're doing the See Here Now Festival Saturday, Danny Clinch's festival, who's been on the show not long ago. It's a great lineup. The Foo Fighters, the Killers. Dave Grohl's a big fan of the band, which has always got to be great to see him too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, like he, I would include him in the list of uh, mind blowers. Yeah. So that festival in particular, I know you're, you're kicking off there and then you go all the way through December, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. We're on a long tour. Um, so we've got this East Coast tour, got some shows in the back in the UK, West Coast, Australia, New Zealand. Amazing. And you haven't um, been to New Zealand in, in a while, right? I think we've been, yeah, that was five, I want to say five years ago. Amazing. When you have free time off in a city like New York, like what are you guys doing? What are you doing today? As a lot example? of pizza. A lot of pizza. Bagels. Yeah. Food. Croutons. <laughs> yeah. Food Only related. croutons. Salmon. <laughs> Tops. Um, dressing. You got a favorite pizza place in New York, by the way? Because I could definitely... You know, turn you on to Joe's. Some good spots. Joe's is a is a good Joe's. one. I mean, uh, Are you a Prince Street Pizza fan? I am. A, yeah, not all the time. Okay, it's quite a lot, isn't it? Yeah, and, and it's, it's a lot, lot, but it's still. And it's not incredible. really a New York pizza, but it's really good. Yeah, it's great. I went to this place, yeah. Lindy Street, yeah. last night yeah. in Brooklyn. Yeah, I was a little disappointed in that place. Wow, yeah. why? Uh, well, I did like a pizza crawl in Williamsburg where I hit like five spots. I liked it. I feel like if you're gonna, I'm, I take my pizza very seriously. I'm a New Yorker. You really have to get the whole pie to judge it correctly. If you get a slice that's been sitting out there for like. Three days. hours. It just doesn't resonate the same. So, have you guys ever heard of Pizza Hut? <laughs> no, <laughs> never. Where, where is that? I I went. Uh, there's one in that square where the the Times Square. Have you ever been to the Times Square? I don't think so. Times Square. Love the Times yeah. The Times Square has this place called the Pizza Hut. <laughs> the Pizza Hut. Yeah, and I thought it was going to be a hut. It was. It wasn't a hut. It was a big no. building, more like an airport. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. With well, a salad buffet. There had all-you-can-eat salad buffet. Is there a good pizza in London? I don't know. 
No, absolutely no. not. <laughs> absolutely not. No. Pizza... Actually, I heard there was a Pizza Hut in, coming in London <laughs> soon. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. We should do just a we whole should... podcast about Royal Blood and pizza. It could be a whole yeah. separate thing. We do this really fun thing at the end of the show, guys, where we do the top five list that go kind of viral. And I'd uh, love to get into it with you guys, which would be great. So I want to talk about your top five best musical duos of all time, wow. starting with number five. Number it's the best. Five. Come on, let's think about it. I think I know who number one. Uh, I think I know. Number well, it's one not including is. yourselves. We can't okay. put yourselves. I would put yourselves. Can we on the start? List. Yeah, I think. Can oh. we make a list and then go? Or do we just go straight in? Yeah, you, I think you careful. go straight in. You kind of go straight in. I want to put Hall and Oates probably at number one, but I think that's a good one, by the way. That's quickly incredible Let's, catalog. But I want to get it right. Yeah, we'll we'll start with number five though. Okay. I don't. I've never had anyone Google on the show, so it's interesting. But like, no, he's, he's, he's not on Googling. My, on my notes. Oh, okay. he's on notes. <laughs> like, Mike so. does not know how to use the Google. I'm just googling a band <laughs> okay. that I just said hey, out loud. I tell you what, you should Google. Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut. Hang on a minute. (laughs) So let's talk about number five then. Number five. um, Top musical duo of all time. There is a Pizza Hut. Are we Googling Pizza Hut? How do we get (laughs) on to Pizza Hut? There's Taco (laughs) Bell slash Pizza Hut. Are they? Wow. Is that, that sometimes they have those things in Europe. We have like Dunkin' Donuts and Hagen Dazs in the same in the same thing. Yeah, it's weird. I don't really get it, but like it's a, a collaboration. I, I don't know if it's not necessarily Ice cream a collaboration. And donuts work together, though, don't they? It's just you see uh, in Greenwich Village. Yeah, they have that. We can. We have so to Ben, there you go. You can get. I can get both. <laughs> Trying to think of musical duos. I'm trying to think how this I'm trying to think about. To the, uh, <laughs> forget musical duos. We got some uh, Dunkin fast Donuldson. food duo over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm putting to, Taco Bell just, and Pizza Hut as number five. You're just googling uh, restaurants that go together. Or something. But, so we'll start with number five. We'll, we'll take it back. Hall and Oates. Hall and Oates. Okay, just that, yeah. It doesn't <laughs> oh, have anyway, to. Anyway, get some. Get okay, great right. number five. The, the White Stripes. Number white four. Stripes. Great number four. Death from Above. Number three. Oh God! Number two. I'm trying to think of you know not necessarily like bands, but just like duos. Duos you know? like McCartney and Lennon. Yeah, they've got a bit. Their numbers. Num- yeah, six. I don't even know if that disqualifies. <laughs> yeah, because I feel like that, that's, that's a band, really. Okay, so I think okay. of duos. Duos yourselves. Well, Simon that's... and Garfunkel. Yeah. yeah. Number two. And the number one, the winner of, of the, the best duo. musical duo of all time. Um, Drum roll, please. Taco Bell and Pizza Hut. <laughs> so, oh, sorry, I'm getting distracted. Um, Number one. I, I know what it is. Yes, okay. you do. It is um, Whitney Houston and uh, who else was it who did um, the theme tune for uh, The thinking? Prince of Egypt? God, I don't Where know. Where you believe. me, I think. Does the winner. No, that one? Um, when, who is it? Is it Tina Turner? No. I can Tina. Wait, I can Tina. No, it's Whitney and this, Mariah Carey. It's Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston. I don't. I don't know if Who they. When you I'm believe. Not sure they when we either. believe. That's a duo. <laughs> is it? That's two know. of them. <laughs> that's uh, Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey. They are Whitney. two separate individuals, but I guess uh, for the purpose of this. This is a good one. Is this a duo? Or is this? Uh... Sorry, I'm getting to yeah, I... again. <laughs> Um, I, I well, might have put. Me, uh, let me find this one. That's the number one for you, Whitney yeah. Houston. Okay. When, uh, when you believe, when we believe. Oh, is this a song yes. that they did Wait, together? We've forgotten. Um, uh, we've forgotten someone. We've we forgot a lot, but this, this is. This... Can we rethink our list? We can. We could. We could start with five again. This, like. is no, this, this is number, number five. This is number one. Uh, yeah. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying this is this has got to be in there as well. What is that? Oh yeah. You might not know this. Is this Wham? I don't know. Who who Robbie is. Williams. Oh, is. Robbie Williams, right? Yeah. And but Kylie Minogue. Oh, and Kylie Minogue. Yeah. Okay. Are they, oh. are they a duo though? This yeah. is a for, fucking for banger, man. Yeah, I think I know this. You're welcome. Robbie Williams, huge in the UK, not as Carly. big here. Robbie and Kylie, man. Yeah. 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 Okay, listen. It's, yes. a, it's whatever it's works for you, the it's the top five. Who else? Who have we missed? I would have probably put my friends The Kills in there just because I, I love The Kills. The Kills, great the kills are great, but yeah. come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but they're not Even The Kills are They're good, not yeah. Robbie Williams and Kylie. No. Sure. Or Mariah and... Uh, wait, I, think, That's I right. think every rock two piece has just been knocked off the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're really breaking the mold here. This is number three and four. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, we're, we're going we're gonna to move on to our next list, but by the way, right, the for, chorus, the for can, listeners that don't the know end, At the end of the podcast, can this be the, the end of it? This can be the credits. credits. Yeah. Yeah. credits sure. That would be great. <laughs> this should be our walk-on. Yeah. <laughs> it's our walk-on. If you come to see us in... Um, see in, you here now. Uh, if you come to see us at Webster Hall... Or Brooklyn Steel. Or Brooklyn Steel, this is going to be played. My girlfriend's American, so I've been introducing her to Robert <laughs> Williams and... By the way, huge artist, but, but never really, you know, didn't do hear what he did in Criminal. Yeah, Criminal. Uh, I love that list, by the way. And another uh, top five we're going to get into, the top five best riffs in rock and roll. I feel like this is an easy one. Yeah, this is, way, this is easier, I think. Right, so we'll start with number five. I find it hard doing it this way around, but okay. Yeah. Or you can start with number one if you like. Yeah, number five, uh, Paranoid on. by Black Sabbath. Great one. I was going to say the Immigrant Song. Another great one. I mean, I know everything reverts four. back to Zeppelin, I guess, right? But number four, yeah. Immigrant Song. They're probably all going to be... Um, yeah. yeah. Number three. Zeppelin songs. <laughs> Can't they? Um, See, I would put Figure It Out in this list, but I can't ooh. because I'm not really part of this conversation. It's more you guys. So number three. I think Gorilla Radio. No, or, uh, Balls on Parade. Yeah. Great riff. I think Balls on Parade. Yeah. Um, number two. I'm going to pick a Queen's one. God. That's another, I mean, that's a task in yeah. itself. Um, oh, man, I don't know where to begin. There's so many. Is that a Queen's song? <laughs> <laughs> we got Desert Sessions. We got a lot of stuff to choose from there. With a new record, which is phenomenal, too. It is amazing. Yeah. We're number two. Odd. I'd put White Stripes, Seven Nation Army. Great, uh, great yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I okay. concur. And the number one greatest riff of all time. Uh, for me, it's Immigrant Song, but... But didn't we... We already said Immigrant that Song, That could right? be we number did, four yeah. as oh, well. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. Can we have it as well, four we, and one? Yeah, well, we'll do another, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a whole lot of love. I don't know. Um, I really like Days and Confused as a riff. Yeah. That could be number four, maybe. Yeah, that before, and then we'll put Immigrant yeah. Song number one. Yeah. All right, great list, great list. And Where one... does Pizza Hut and Taco Bell fit into this? Uh, it's somehow it's going to be the next question. Your favorite fast food places in New York. Um, actually, the last top five I wanted to get into, top five things that are your pet peeves about each other after being in a band for 10 years together. Top five? Top five or your five. I don't know if I could name one. Maybe you don't have them. The good thing no, about being in a duo is you really don't have it sometimes. That's why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why it's going so well. <laughs> yeah. There are no peeves. Just That's we it. have a lot of pets, but uh, no peeves. Yeah. You get along incredibly well. You in fact, the, never... pet, the pets are the peeves. <laughs> you never really Too disagree. Too many pets. <laughs> you never disagree. The pets are the pervs. <laughs> <laughs> He's got pervy pets. Yeah. <laughs> There are none, right? There are no, you guys Not never really. get each other's... Pets or peeves? Uh, either one. He's got pets. <laughs> I do. I have a dog. And I've got peeves. That's true. So <laughs> PV amps. <laughs> there we go. So you'd say you're one of those bands that get along famously, never get on each other's nerves at all, nothing like that? I mean, yeah, we pretend to get on for the money, honestly. Yeah, <laughs> we fucking hate each Just other. Just for the money. Yeah, we hate yeah. each other. All right, well, I guess that would wrap up the top five. Of your, <laughs> there you go. Is, well, one last one I'll leave you with. The top, I know these are all like your children because the new record's amazing like we just spoke about, but if you had to name your top five best Royal Blood songs, what would those be for you? Um, Waves, which is off the new album. Yep. Um, Shine in the Dark, which is oh, that's off the new album as well. Yep. Yeah, great pull, track, by the way. Uh, probably Pull Me Through. Um, so it's all the new which record. is off the yeah. new album <laughs> yeah, Boilermaker Boilermaker Boiler Boiler great track which isn't off the new album yeah. and I think we owe figure it out quite a lot and Out of the Black yeah a bonus track for Out of the Black maybe yeah but yeah. do you want to ask us about our favourite ones yeah <laughs> <laughs> those are your favourite yeah. ones or those are not your favourite ones no, at this point I think these are the ones that we owe our career to have you so in terms of like playing the new record, obviously, I think Saturday is going to be the first time that you're performing some of these songs, right? Yeah, yeah. We've um, only just started unveiling some of these new tracks. So, yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, sorry. I think my Uber's here. <laughs> Four records in and such. Is it hard to create a set list at this point? So many great. The catalog's incredible. So many great songs. We've got a lot of terrible songs. So it's well, pretty you easy. Some, you got some great ones, too. Um, it's actually more fun because um, there's options now. Yeah. 
If we came to see, would you be playing a bunch off the new record for this? We'd just be playing Figure It Out. That's it. The just, whole, yeah, you want to hear it again? Ten you versions gotta, of Figure It Out. Give them what they want. <laughs> well, the tour kicks off this Saturday. See her now. It's a phenomenal new record. By the way, congrats again, number one in Thank the UK Thanks, four man. times. So we need a number one in the US now. And we got to get into the whole Pizza Hut conversation. How do we do it? How well, do we do it? That'll be the next podcast. Maybe we do a Taco Bell collaboration. Maybe like it's, a, Hut. Let's maybe it's let's a song go about that Pizza collaboration. Hut shoes. That could it's be that. worked for Pizza Hut. Why can't it work for By us? By the way, the whole new record, the next record could just be about Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. That's a great idea. That's exa- it's called Pet Peeves. If you need an inspiration for record. If you don't know this song, Google it. Google it, listen to it, stream it, steal it. Robbie Williams. Telling you, man. Real Blood, I've been a lifelong fan. I appreciate you coming in. Check out the guys on tour starting this Saturday. By the time this comes out, the show will already pass. But you're playing in New York, Brooklyn Steel, Webster yes. Hall. Yes. I think you're playing at the Wiltern in LA too, right? Yeah. 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 Not so, in that order. That would be terrible <laughs> planning. It would be. And back to New York. <laughs> but either way, I'll be at the show. So I'm excited to see you guys. Amazing. From the Mercury Lounge to hopefully Brooklyn Steel or Webster Hall. So I appreciate you coming in. I'm excited to see you guys soon. And thank you so much, as always. Thanks, thank man. You. I appreciate, appreciate it. it.